huge response to it. And, and I really think it made a difference in, in identifying the vocabulary of what your show is. That's right. That's right. That's very important. And one of the, our challenges with Douglas Carter Bean on, on Cinderella was that he's a very contemporary playwright. Mm -hmm. And there were times that we had to pull him back uh, his his political sensibility <laughs> and his snarky sensibility at times, and you know, it was very natural to him, and was would be funny to all of us, but but wrong vocabulary mm -hmm. for a, a, a family show and Cinderella in particular. So those kinds of things are always things that you're that to keep your show in one vocabulary to make sure the sound is is a score. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's the difficulty of pop songs. I yeah. think is that it's not really a score. That's it's right. a lot of great songs. Right. I, mean, I mean, I love the show, right? And I love those songs. I grew up with them. I mean, the good thing is that it, there's a singular voice behind yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. So that even Absolutely. even though the and and because the story of the show is about the sound changing over the course of right. this decade between Meet Her in 1959 and, and it ends up in 1971, and so. You're watching the evolution of music, and the evolution of music is happening through the score, mm -hmm. through the evening. Um, but I have I have one quick little story, um, uh, just about the uh, finding finding the right place for a song. So we were we were we were in San Francisco, and one of the most well known songs in the show, "You've Got a Friend." Everyone loves the song. It's it's the, a song that Carol at her concerts will often play as the encore because it's one of the most well known songs that she's ever written. So we thought, well, we're gonna replicate that experience by putting it last in our show. So we're going to have her sing I Feel the Earth Move and everybody's clapping along and then we'll top it with this great encore, You've Got a Friend, terrific song, everybody everybody will be bringing their lighters out and, 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 and uh, it, it, this will be terrific. So we get to our invited dress in San Francisco and, we, uh, the, and the show has gone uh, quite well. Uh, we get to the finale, they sing Earth Move, everybody is up, up on their feet, they're very excited, and then, bum, 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 bum. napalm. <laughs> it, we, it completely didn't work, and, and at that point, that was when I, in the back of the house, walked out onto uh, uh, Geary Avenue in San Francisco, uh, and uh, uh, I didn't watch the rest of it. because Waited we just car to hit you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we cut it immediately. It didn't even make it to the first preview. Um, but we knew we had to find a place for this song, but we knew that it didn't work there. Um, so once, w uh, between San Francisco and New York, we, um, we were restructuring the second act, and the, the part of the plot where uh, Carol moves to California was something that didn't actually exist in San Francisco. And in between um, San Francisco and New York, we, we found that the, what was missing about the show was that we, people wanted to see the, the evolution of tapestry and watching tapestry kind of come to life. And that part of it was um, kind of glossed over in the San Francisco version. So uh, we, we, were gonna, we knew we were going to add the plot element of her choosing to leave New York and move to, move to California. And as part of that, um, uh, we came up with the idea of her saying goodbye to her friends in the, in the building. And, and Jason overnight did this arrangement um, for the four, for three voices, and then uh, Jeff Brown as Donnie Kirshner also joined, so that it, it became a four-part vocal arrangement around the piano. It's very simple, it's not, it's unorchestrated, it's just, it's just piano, it's the only song that's completely just piano in the whole show. And uh, by giving it that kind of context, and by giving it um, a, a, a kind of window into a reflection of why that song was written, um, it, it is now, I think, one of the more successful moments of the show. Whereas, it, but it's the same song, you know. It, 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 and it, so it's it's all about kind of finding that that right moment and and setting it up in the right way and allow, giving the audience a lens to see it. I mean, and, and that's the all the way through that show. I think that's what um, the goal was with with these pop songs that are so well known. That the task is to give the audience um, some kind of new lens in which to appreciate them in a new way. And I, feel, I feel like we're all hitting on a very interesting topic that I'd love to spend a moment about uh, in developing musicals, which is who and what your audience is. And I think it's one of the very first things that you really have to think about when you're creating a show. Um, I think today, and you've done this, uh, in terms of adapting musicals based on movies and how and sort of balancing expectation of what a, a movie is and creating it for the stage. I think it's one of the things of, I think it's what makes that move very tricky and how to do that um, yeah, successfully. I don't honestly think that much about it. 
Okay. I used to, you know, when I did uh, the opera Harveyville, mm -hmm. it was one of the first big out operas done in uh, San Francisco, Houston, and New York. And I said, oh, the gays are going to come out in droves. Mm -hmm. No. Um, new music people came out in droves. Mm -hmm. And I found that in certain communities like Houston, the gays said, oh, opera's for the old queens. We don't go to opera. Um, and that's history. We don't care about that. I was shocked. Great Gardens, I thought, um, oh, all the Great Gardens fanatics will come out and they'll dress up like Little Edie. <laughs> a couple came with baskets of tomatoes the first night. They were ready to defend it to the teeth. Turns out they liked it, but the biggest audience was, again, not the gays. It was mothers and daughters. So you never know. And I say, I don't write for my friends. I write for friends I haven't met. Mm -hmm. who, are, who are care enough to buy tickets and come to see things. Well, I, you know, when we were doing Avenue Q, we were doing it at the Vineyard off Broadway first, um, lots of people in the business came to see it and they all loved it, but they said, you're not going to move that to Broadway, are you? Um, and who's it for? And uh, Jeffrey Seller and I used to hear that a lot, and finally we said, well, let's say to that person, well, I guess it's not for you. <laughs> because I don't know who it's for, but I know we love it, and many people love it, and uh, that's just the way it is. Now, I mean, even Nathan Lane said to me, you're not going to move that puppet show to Broadway, are you? <laughs> and I always like to tell the story that cut to who hands me my Tony Award, but Nathan Lane. <laughs> Nobody knows who it should be. If it's good, it'll make it. Oh, I just wanted to spend a few minutes on where we all think musical theater is going, because we see a lot of movies. Every day I get a call from somebody who wants to take their songs and make them into a jukebox musical. I'm tired of it, actually. Um, uh, I always find that musicals and ideas that come from artists themselves are the best, because they're passionate about them. And, they, and I think the work when you hire, when they're for hire, it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Doug Bean came to me, I, I pitched the idea to him that I wanted a Cinderella story where she uh, uh, changed the prince's life as much as he changed hers because I didn't want to tell little girls that they were going to be whisked off by some guy. I wanted them to tell little girls that they could change the world and uh, be proactive. And he left my office and came back and pitched the story. He was passionate about it. He had a little girl. He wanted his little girl to see this story. Uh, that's why we did Cinderella, really. And then we pitched it to Ted. Um, so uh, I, I'm hoping that, that there are more original musicals on Broadway. What you saw last night, for those of you who were there, uh, are just totally original musicals, which I'm a huge fan about, that those writers are passionate about. But what do you think? What do you guys think? I'm bullish on musicals. You know, when I grew up, everyone was listening to Carol King. And you couldn't be caught dead going to musicals, and I would go and see Pearly for three yeah. hours. Yeah. <laughs> the last, or, or Coco. I mean, who went to see those? <laughs> well, but today, all the kids know musicals. I teach, you know, and I see, and they love them. I think they're sick to death of the internet. They love the feeling of actually feeling this early music in the theater. Uh, we don't go to church so much, we don't go to Rosh Hashanah, we go to the theater, and it's, it's one of, and I think that there are more original musicals. Producers, such as you, um, are, are getting adventurous and finding ways to budget things, um, so that, I mean, we've had a spate of original musicals. We're having uh, Janine Tesori's is coming this year, um, and... Uh, and a Sting's musical? Right, and, uh, and I say that, Kids love them, and they they can and and all of course the aging rock stars now love them. Mm -hmm. uh, they found a whole new venue, so I think that it's uh, in, we're back to being the great American art form in, within five years. I, I um, went to, I'm a fan of Forbidden Broadway, and you know it, it, when it's good, it's really good. And the one that did, was there recently didn't last that long, but I've heard that Cinderella was in it, um, and and also the carry on to its sounding music, so I figured that I better go and take it like a man. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really took away from it is that the Cinderella is mean and all that kind of stuff.
stuff. But the last, in, the last line in the Cinderella thing in, in Forbidden Broadway was, well, it doesn't really matter what it is. It still is Disney light. And I thought to myself, you know what? It's not Disney light. Because one of the problems of the Broadway musical theater is when these institutions like Disney come in, they have absolutely endless checkbooks. They can, they can spend any amount of money they want. And, and that is what Aladdin is. If you see Aladdin, it's wonderful. It's very, very good. It's very well done. And there are you know, like enough costumes for about 18 musicals on that stage. And I thought, you know, I mean, it, it kind of, the, that comment about Cinderella is not only wrong-minded, but, it, but I thought it's dangerous because if there are not independent producers doing shows, and especially you know new ones. I mean, I think Tom Schumacher would love to do a very good, in, you know, inventive new musicals, and I don't think he ever will because I think ultimately he works for the mouse, and the mouse wants to go through that catalog and make more Aladdin's, which is fine. I have no problem with that. But the way Cinderella was was produced so it could exist on a weekly basis in a Broadway theater and not lose all the, I mean, I don't think Rocky had a, a, a single week during its run where it ever made its weekly nut. Um, you know, and that's just not good producing. So I think, I think the more independent producers there are who are smart, who understand how to listen to artists and work with artists and also, you know, get, get a hearing for the Schubert's so they can, or the Needlelanders or the Jams so they can actually get a theater. You know, I think that really does need to be encouraged and I think there, you know, every time there is an original musical on Broadway that people like, Next to Normal being one, you know, fairly recent one, Grey Gardens. Um, it, it, the original is that such a wacky movie, you know, who would ever <laughs> But there no, are these passing strange, there's yeah, no, but I, genre. Yeah, no, but I, but I think right. those need to be encouraged and they need to, to be successful. And as you say, there are, there are audiences, there are audiences for Aladdin and there are audiences for those. And I think what really needs to, to be, what Broadway, especially Broadway, needs to continue to be is, is the, to have a spectrum, and if it doesn't have a, a spectrum, you know, yes, the tourists need to have something to go to. You know, yes, the New Yorkers, strange that may sound, need something to go to. So I've got it. Well, on that note, I'm going to let Ted and Andy go back to yeah, rehearsing rehearsal. their show yeah. for tonight. <laughs> and thank you. Very much. the creative team of String onto the stage. Uh, Adam Guan, composer lyricist, and Sarah Hammond, book writer, and Mark is the director. <laughs> so, we're here to talk about your musical, but mostly we're here to talk about lyrics. <laughs> uh, here's what Ira Gershwin said about lyric writing. A fondness for music, a feeling for rhyme, a sense of whimsy and humor, an eye for the balanced sentence, an ear for the current phrase, and the ability to imagine oneself a performer trying to put over the number in progress. Is that what you do, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to. I, I think the thing that I love about lyric writing is that it is such a structured um, art form. Um, there are some serious limitations that you have to deal with when you're writing a lyric. Um, and all of that stuff, you know, performance and whimsy and humor, trying to fit that into this very contained thing um, is like such a joy and such a challenge. Um, and I think when you, when you can figure it out and actually use those limitations to nail humor and rhyme and, and, and honesty, um, I think it just soars like nothing else. Well, just to go back for a second, uh, what was your impulse to work on this musical, Sarah? And uh, how did you find each other? Right. So we met in, the, in a mentorship program at the Dramatist Guild that you run now. <laughs> <laughs> the, we met in the Dramatist Guild Fellows program where I was a playwright and Adam was writing Ordinary Days at the time. It's a musical that, uh, that Robin produced. And Josh. And that's Mark <laughs> and Mark <laughs> We all have family. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, well, Adam says when I read a monologue that I wrote, he heard, well, I guess you should say it. <laughs> yeah, well, we, did, we, were, we were in this year-long fellowship program, each um, presenting work in progress um, on a regular basis. Um, and I sort of immediately took a shine to 
Sarah's work, um, and I think vice versa. We just sort of felt this simpatico. We both um, really like getting at great big things of the heart through very specific details. The 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 just choosing the the just right odd special thing that tells you who someone is and why they're falling apart at that time. And why the fates? How why the fates? Um, well, so I wanted to write a love story. wanted it to be able to sing. Um, this layer of they are three Greek gods in, in our world, and one of them falls in love with somebody and it wreaks havoc with her life. Um, uh, and his life. And his life, and <laughs> literally his life. Um, it, it, it becomes, the, the, whole, the whole concept and structure of it be, becomes a, a, just a larger than life way to look at love, to look at um, what it does to you when you fall in love with someone, how you can't control it, even if you are the fate, the, the, the main fate. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and, and you have to make certain decisions along the way as this, as this thing, this feeling is running away with you, with your life. Um, so and, and what did you learn last night? Well, I, the, what we the the sort of portion of the show that we um, chose to present last night was sort of the the like the main love story, which is what we had been focusing our work on up to this point. Really, sort of figuring out the main plot of Mickey and Atticus. Um And for me, something that I, I realized last night was sort of the um, that the real turn of that relationship, sort of the moment the shoe drops in that relationship, which was, for me watching it last night, the, the every little thing number where he realizes like the consequences of um, his immortality. Um, and it's so, it's always so interesting to see your work up in, like people were saying, in front of people for the, uh, the first time where you are sort of just sitting back and receiving it, which is such a different experience from sitting at a table and pouring through pages and like intellectually analyzing everything. Um, and it's a very different and important step to be able to like let that go for 45 minutes and just watch what's happening and receive it. Um, and being able to sort of feel the emotional arc of that story as opposed to like intellectually try to piece it together on the page. Um, something that I really experienced last night in a beneficial way to sort of help us shape the rest of the show around what we, we feel the sort of main spine of it is. I also added, just for this presentation, added this, what, like, a bar of music to the very end that, mm -hmm. um, that actually, uh, it, the difference between the doom chord and she sets in free music. <laughs> 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 and, and Adam added, sets in free music just for this concert so we wouldn't end that last number with a just sort of rumor because we needed to do the plot and whatever, but actually, I think that, <laughs> um, but I think that it was- And um, feel good. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's actually actually a necessary step in, in, in that spot in the show that we- It doesn't mean you can't be moved. <laughs> but, you know, somebody said once, you know, musicals start on the ground and end in the heavens, you know, and, or, you know, or, or somebody else said musicals have to be north of the floor, you know, they have to, lift you up in some way, even if you're if you're feeling moved and sad, it's it's still a large emotion, which we don't feel in our everyday life. Or maybe some of you do, and there's medication for that. <laughs> uh, Mark, how did you feel about how it went last night? Yeah, I, I, I think I, we, we were all sort of talking at breakfast this morning about that very thing of just, I, 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 think, I think we all responded to the, the spine of that um, of that moment that Adam was describing of, uh, of finding how the, the the small action of this uh, of this love story and her choosing to not cut the string and I, I in listening to the demos when they when I they brought me on board to, when you uh, sent them to me that was the that was the part that I responded to in listening to it for the first time just as a one person audience member but I think the um, one comment I wanted to get back to about what we were talking about before about um, receiving. Comments, comments, and receiving um, uh, both criticism and also just just feedback on audiences collectively don't lie. <laughs> people individually, they they may not lie to you, but they may give you an opinion. You get a lot of different opinions from a lot of different people. But the the when when 
you have the group response of everybody in an audience together, and they all have the same response at the same time, you can really feel when they get it, you know, and, and, I, and so that, you could, you could just feel that the energy in the room last night of, 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 of uh, especially at the end, being quite moved by his, by her, her finally realizing that she needed to um, let him go, and that, that, and that ended up being, I think, very moving in a, in a, in a somewhat surprising way to, to all of us. Yes, I think so. Michael, you had never heard this score before or experienced no, and I didn't know your work before, but I'm a big supporter of uh, uh, the dramatists. Uh, which group did you, the playwrights do? The Fellows, the Dramatists of Fellows. Yes, and also the one that... Uh, oh, New Dramatists. New Dramatists, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a playwright at a... Or was... I just graduated from a seven-year residency at New Dramatists. And Adam's work I love, and every time I'm on a panel, I give him a grant. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. Yes, I agree. Um, I'm a little bit um, uncertain of how to respond in such a public way. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, no, um, I know. I mean, did you want to talk about lyrics? Yes. Adam writes impeccable lyrics. Yes. And I always love it when um, the lyric and the music comes as an impulse uh, together. Um, I would just say that in order to get where you want to get to that very moving place, a surprising place, it's not, for example, The Little Mermaid. She does not go to the sea witch and sacrifice her, she doesn't go to Zeus and sacrifice her life so that he can live. It's a twist that I haven't actually seen before, which is good. Um, to get to that place, metaphysical musicals are a handful. You know, we've had one this year, uh, Big Fish, that I know they're trying to now do a smaller version of. They're just to I wrote a metaphysical musical. People have a tough time with them. And I think it's the ground rules. Um, I think when you go into fantasy land, um, you have to be absolutely clear. The reason why Disney is so successful, so a movie like Toy Story, every single one of those toys has a specific function that feeds into the plot and pays off into the climax. So, and the ground rules are clear. Uh, remember the Guys and Dolls called itself a musical fable. And it was set in a New York City that was kind of magical. Not 50s, not 40s, not 30s, not 20s. That's the feeling that I got from yours, that we were in a musical fable in a magical city. Um, and hidden among our everyday lives are these fates or string makers that actually have the task of controlling human destiny. Is that right so far? I was wishing that there was a way I would have had that information right up front. And it brings to mind the story of Jerome Robbins and uh, Funny Thing Happened, a very hackneyed story to those of us in musical theater. But it's useful to remember that nobody knew what that show was, also with Greek myths, uh, until Jerome Robbins came in and said, well, you need to tell them it's a comedy in the first opening minutes. And your opening song was about another Wednesday or something, a, a work day, and it incorporated the regular workforce. And within that, we found the, the sub-workforce, the hidden workforce of the fates. I felt I would have loved to, to get the information, musical, in, musical fable, magical New York, we make strings, we're the string makers, and we are hidden about it. And I didn't need to hear the information about the other people's Wednesday. What I needed to have right up front was a clear definition of what a string is, what they're doing, what their function is. And then I felt yeah, it's the opening number issue. Then your story is off and running. And I think that's a lyric thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. I, I was saying to Mark last night, uh, are we setting up the world of the faiths clearly enough? I, I don't think so. And um, 
any time they were contemporary in feeling, it felt wrong to me that they are otherworldly and they have to be very specifically otherworldly in, in their vocabulary and their, you know, in, in how the, they're the strangers who come to town. Really. And, you know, I always say there's only two or three stories in the world, and one of them is strangers, a stranger comes to town. And we don't get, we don't understand how long they've been there, uh, why they're there yet. I mean, I know there's a bigger book story, but, but I think that what Michael's saying is very true. There's something that's not clear enough about who they are and, and how they're functioning in that yeah, I think with the metaphysical thing, I mean, there's death takes a holiday. There's, yes. Uh, what's the other one? Oh, oh, Borrowed yeah. borrow time, yeah. where somebody yeah. gets yeah. caught yeah. in a time continuum and bad things start yeah. happening one to other people. Yeah, one touch of Venus. One touch yeah. of Venus. Yeah. 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 I think my spirit. Death, my spirits. Yeah. death is a tough thing for people to deal with in musicals. And you can try and lighten it up, but it's scary. <laughs> so we need to know clearly the rules. That's well, it was interesting, when you were talking about the musical lifting people up, I was thinking at the end of Carousel, you know, I mean, what can be a sadder thing? And yet at the end of Carousel, when he says, I love you, Julie, know that I love you, and walks out, you feel like you've just been absolutely... <laughs> you know, Carousel was a metaphysical music, so it was Break the Doom. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. 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 So we totally and they are, I mean, nothing the could be sadder, and yet right. the entire audience, you are really incredibly brilliant. Right. They by started the with the very real people, both. It started with the, the Carousel Waltz, we meet Big, Billy Bigelow and Julie Jordan, which is probably the greatest scene in musical theater history, uh, where you, um, where, where they go opposite, with the, the, if I loved you. Oh, and in the very so. next scene, they're married. <laughs> or Brigadoon is the hunters that encounter this strange situation, but they're very real, and we recognize them as types we know from New York. And they are the conduit through the metaphysical world. Isn't If I Love You the song that Oscar said, if he ended it on a vowel, it would have been played on the radio? But well, that was What's the one Use of Wondering. Oh, that's What's the Use of Wondering, right. <laughs> is that Will? Is that all the rest is Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's what it was. I thought it was. And yeah. all the rest is talk. And all the rest is talk. <laughs> as a, and, or instead of all the rest, uh, he wrote another little later. That's all you need to know. What is it? That's all you need to know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I know I read it, but obviously I have no retention. <laughs> um, so where do you go from here, Mark? Well, um, I don't know if uh, Adam wants to talk to the, the, the next step, but um, they, these, these guys have been working diligently over the last week to kind of talk through the uh, plot points of the first act and have, have already kind of excised a couple of songs that were um, in the draft up until this point and are, they're now... Um, I think going to stay stay around here for a couple of yeah, days. We go, to, we go right here next. Uh, yeah. we're, we're sticking around for another few days just to take advantage of the peace and quiet and get some writing done. Um, um, and then with the, the show is going to be part of a, a showcase of new musicals um, back in New York next month. Um, um, so we're kind of aiming for, that. aiming for that as well. And then sometime in the spring, we're going to do a full reading of it when you guys feel you're ready. Right? We'll just, so we can hear the whole thing through and really have a sense of where we are. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't put a timetable on these things. That's what I said last night about sometimes they take four years, sometimes they take two years. It, you just never know. You have to let them evolve in their own way and you have to, you know, it's a, it's a patient process. And so once we do that reading, we'll see where we go next, but we're going to keep moving forward. That's the idea of the festival is that we we spend, uh, you know, a year working with these musicals, and hopefully by the end of that year, or before the end of that year, we can find a production. Um, and so that's where we are with this one. Uh, anybody have any questions about string before we go on to the next, or should we? Yes. Um, so a lot of the songs, I think maybe about four or five of the songs last night were expository, in the head kind of songs where they're talking about what they're thinking and all of that, versus you know, and a couple of them were the interactive ones. Mm -hmm. How do you decide whether it's an outside the head or inside the head or a conversation or whether it's all you know, sort of? Oh gosh, um, there's a there there is a lot of conversation between Sarah and I. We just kind of um, sit around and talk um, and uh, 
lots of ideas come up in those, in those conversations, some for a very fleeting moment and then are discarded, some which sort of gnaw your brain. Um, Sometimes it has to do with the way I write the source material for him to begin with. Um, it, some, sometimes I'll write a scene with a particular like theatrical vocabulary and Adam will very faithfully write the song with like, the, the character was speaking in direct address and the way I wrote the scene and so he'll have the character sing that sort of stuff. Or sometimes I'll write a scene, he'll look at it and he'll take it away on his own and then just put a song wherever he wants in it and it's, <laughs> and it's something I would never have expected to be the song. And um, we found that both ways work and we never know which one it's going to be. I mean, I think it's, it's a constant sort of, every song comes from a different place in our Sometimes show. Sometimes you just need to deepen a, a character in the moment and so they need to sing from their own head and, and express a longing or a something. Uh, and sometimes they need to be interactive. It's just the way of the script. Really. I mean, and right now we're at the stage where we have a whole draft. We're looking at how to balance things. And there are some missing interactions. We're talking right now about the next song we know we want to try to get in is an interaction between the sisters in song in which they're not working so that we can get a feeling for what their relationship is. Um, so like that... The idea for this moment is going to be related to the plot and everything. We actually are starting with that target. I don't know if that's what he'll write. That's the thing. We have the conversation and we say that's the goal, but then the, the impulse has to, has to be right. Yes? First of all, it was just so exciting to see. So thank you all of you for making this happen. And um, in the process of deciding which seven, I think, songs that you were going to showcase, did you learn about the other songs in the show? Was it agonizingly difficult to think? I don't know how many you have at this moment that are sort of safe and in. I, are you hearing this on the live feed? Okay, great. Sorry. Um, yes, because I, I, think, I think one of our sort of next step things that we're trying to figure out is we have been, we had we sort of had a draft and then the goal leading up to this thing was sort of strengthening and, and identifying the, that main love story. And our next step on our agenda is then to sort of figure out how the, the B story, the, the other sisters sort of hook into this main story. Um, and, and I think simply by working out the, the, the touchstones of the main story sort of helps illuminate in some ways ways in which the, uh, the rest of the script can sort of hook into it. Um, but it was important for us to sort of, you know, hang the line that we can then hang other things on, but to get that, to get that solid thing up and sort of let that inform how the rest of it was going to fold in. And if I could just add two specific things. One, I just love, I don't know if onomatopoeia is the right thing, but the ha-ha-ha. <laughs> I mean, the way you use language and it the music and what was going spec was that in that one or spanks I forget spec is a book thing okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was just so magical oh, thank you. and then the one I don't know if it's a criticism or just me but early on in the show when the three sisters are singing in uh, counterpoint or all at the same time and I couldn't understand any of it I was in the front row and I wanted to know but I appreciate the complexity. <laughs> and I just don't know if that's just me or if there's a way to do it where we get to know what they're all saying and then they join sure, in yeah. the counterpoint. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that that would make rapid sense. fire, I don't know. Yeah, no, it makes like, sense. Yeah. Could have been our sound system, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. But why don't you guys move down to the end and we'll invite oh, sure. <laughs> the thanks team to come up. Uh, Lindsay Turner wrote the book. Gary Adler is our composer. Coming up first is Phoebe Kreutz, our lyricist. <laughs> um, it is one to the hilarious. Is <laughs> um, so, uh, Hi. you know, it, it's funny, I was thinking this morning that both shows are really about different cultures meeting, in a way, mm -hmm. right? And, and when we first uh, met together, that was one of the first things we talked about is that we were going to try to pull out the, the cultural complexities and, and specific, specific things about each culture so that we could really see that there was a, 
a clash and then a meeting of the minds finally in the musical. Um, how did you feel about last night and, and what you accomplished? Because I think you came a great distance. Yeah. yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Um, no, it was it was really fun. I mean, obviously it was so fun and, and I'm, I'd be lying if I was if I said I was, you know, thinking about it from an intellectual standpoint back there. I was mostly just like, oh my god, people are laughing. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, because we wrote it, we've been writing it for, golly, you know, Gary just did the math and it's been a really long time. <laughs> which, which I'm forbidden to say it all. It's been a while. We all are. So, uh, it's been 40 years. Um, <laughs> we were just children when we started. <laughs> so small. But, you know, we, we had the idea just thinking, like, we want to do something fun and we want to do something frothy that had, like, a lively vocabulary where we could feel like we could be silly and... And I think, you know, pilgrims and Indians tap dancing just sort of made us all laugh <laughs> as an idea. But then when we started meeting with Robin and Josh and thinking, we don't want it to just come off like a, like a skit that goes on for two hours, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like there has to be a heart to it. And I think it's been interesting to sort of try and pull that out. And we added the finale recently just to sort of try and give it, you know, I mean, you want to end on an up note. You don't want to stand there and moralize, but something that says this is a universal thing and it's not only about tap dancing pilgrims. Um, so, you know, I think, and I mean, you know, I'm, not, I'm just yammering. Um, no, you're fine. You're but fine. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I think, you know, it was interesting last night just seeing that, yes, like, okay, we're not crazy, like there's something here that is fun and funny and people seem to like it and they, they want to go on the ride. I think it just sort of gives us the responsibility to make sure that ride is as satisfying as possible and to keep on surprising people and creating things that mean something more than just like, okay, well now it's another bunch of jokes. Yeah, yeah um, the surprise element really yeah. works in your show, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay, what did you say? Oh, no, I was just going to say, last night, last night was the first time we've ever heard it in front of a, a large audience of people. We've had a couple of readings where, you know, we each invited five people and we've, you know, because we have a large cast, they each invite two, it turns into a bigger room, but we've never had a paying audience in front of us before. And, and the idea that they seemed to find it very satisfying, was great for us. And I think the thing that really came through, like Phoebe was saying, you know, we, we started off thinking, oh, pilgrims and Indians, and think of all the rhyme schemes that could happen, and the tap dancing, and all the jokes, ha ha. And then as we began to get into it, we thought really about the culture clash, and how, you know, it is about, it is about two groups of people who are trying to understand each other, and how much that does relate to family and Thanksgiving where you wind up with other people in your house that you don't see eye to eye with, and what else are you going to do but sit down and eat? And that's like, those are some heavier themes. So, um, you know, I, just from a book standpoint for a second, yes. you know, Regina and I, uh, my writing partner's not here because she's getting married on Sunday, um, but if she were here, uh, she could join me in saying that um, the, the hard part for us just as book writers was actually the straight line, was the two people who meet and they're completely different and they don't like each other and then they fall in love, which is like at the heart of every great musical. <laughs> but trying to find an honest way to get at it is incredibly difficult. Trying to make it interesting is nearly impossible. And um, the great thing for us, I think, in, in going through it and hearing it last night is the straight line is there, which is great. You know, we were thrilled because it's been the hardest thing for us to do, so we were really happy. You know? And then everybody laughed, which made it better. So, <laughs> So, Gary, how do you write your songs together? Do you do lyrics first? Do you do music or do you do both? Um, for the most, I would say for most of the songs that uh, we experienced last night, Phoebe wrote the lyrics first. Every so often, um, we may have a discussion, the, the four of us actually, and come up with what is the musical moment. Then Phoebe and I will go off and discuss, okay, what could the hook of the song be? And, um, then once we figure that out, she may go and write the entire lyric and then hand it to me and then I may make some adjustments as I put the music on it. Or she, like in the case of the finale, we were talking about, well, what are we really saying here? Mix it up is what we're ultimately saying in a hook form. And um, so I just came up with kind of how the main part of the chorus might scan, just repeating mix it up, mix it up thinking it could be just like the end of uh, Full Monty, let it go, let it go. You just repeat lyrics and people will think, okay, well, that's a book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, so I kind of came up with the structure of the chorus, and then she wrote the chorus and the verses herself, and then gave it back to me, and then 
Um, I put the music on, so that was a little bit more back and forth, but mostly it's Phoebe first. So Michael, what about this thing about repeating words over and over? <laughs> Is that something you teach? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's also so that you can learn the melody. Yeah. Uh, a composer needs something to um, hang on to and to, to make the melody soar. And repeated words, when they're used in different ways, are a great way to advance the story and also leave the audience with a, a melody. Mm -hmm. And how did you respond to these songs? Oh, I had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> they're very witty, I have to say. Uh, you know, I think so charming about it is that it was funny all the way through, but it was also topical, and it didn't have to announce it. It just was. So that says something is right about this time for doing this show. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think on a serious note of those kids coming across the border from South America, and people standing in the middle of the road mm -hmm. uh, with guns to make the buses turn back, yeah. and say, call on the National Guard, you know? I said, yeah, call them and take those people away. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. um, no, this is that time again. We thought we were beyond it, and we're yeah. not beyond it. Here we are, and this is a great way to bring awareness to it without being didactic about it. I always feel, I, I felt last night uh, that it's so, you know, it's so wonderful that they're not cliche Native Americans, Native Americans, <laughs> uh, and that, you know, you play with who they are and how they function in the world, and then uh, Susanna tries to become the cliché Indian. And where, did she, where did she get that idea, I wondered? I mean, is that something that you were going for? Or is that something that somebody should call her on? You know, we don't put our heads in hair and braids anymore. Yeah, I mean, probably. You know, I, I, yeah. I was, that made me a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know? Yeah. I was, I was wondering how you guys felt about that. I mean, it may not stay. Like we've, you know, we've, we've been playing back and forth. I mean, with this, all these different plot points for so long, and I think we, you know, we're trying to figure out. I mean, how was the first song we wrote for the show, and I we've love written song. about, you know, eight different versions of it when it came up in different places. You know, because for a while, Susanna and Squanto used to see each other in the woods every day, and it was like months went by and they saw each other and they would say, sing the song. But then it was like, well, no, we can't have her just be hanging out in the woods for months and not be like, <laughs> that is not forward motion. Yes. So, and then, you know, so we had all these different versions of it, and then sometimes it was a, all of a dream sequence, and sometimes it's half a dream sequence. And so this was just like, well, if she was left by herself, and all she wanted to do was be like people around her, like, she might have this terrible same, idea same, same. to <laughs> try and dress up like an Indian, you know, and it would be like, Ridiculous but and who's bad. modeling that behavior? Well, I mean, I know. It's <laughs> well, well, she yeah. read books back then. The, yeah. We actually, we actually did talk about that for a while. There was, there used to be a section in the show that was, the pilgrims actually knew what they were walking into, which is historically accurate. They did. Yes. They knew that there were yeah. Indians there, and there was literature about it that portrayed them as these savages. Right. And um, you know, it's one of those things that we've had that, and then we cut it, and you get these little bits and pieces that are sort of vestigial. Yes. Um, but I, I was wondering if that was one of them. It, it is. It is, and it's not. Yeah. I mean, it actually yeah. that that idea used to belong to Joan, and then we had given it to Susanna. Yeah. I mean, I will say this: we've, you know, Phoebe has gone above and beyond with how because it's always been such a great song but she has rewritten it a lot and I think right now we're in a very successful yes. place with it I think I mean we did uh, when Regina and I my writing partner and I um, redrafted the book uh, not the draft that you saw but the one before there was a place where Squanto called Susanna on her transformation and said you know this is what you think I am you know and he's hurt and I think that I think that might be worth exploring just because, you know, you do have preconceived, we all have preconceived notions about people who are different than us, and there is something to be said for that when we are talking about something that is topical. Uh, yeah, you know. and we talked about um, the way the Native Americans are depicted now, they're mm -hmm. pretty sophisticated, they're artisanal, yes. and, uh, yeah, yeah they're, they're very high-end people, very, very high-end people, local. much like, you know, the people today who are gluten-free and uh, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And the more specific we get about that, I think, is, yeah. is fun. Absolutely. Really fun Absolutely. and hilarious, actually. Mm -hmm. And the pilgrims, you know, they're, they're not so good. <laughs> <laughs> not so good. Um, 
So, anybody, anybody have any questions about that show that they saw? Yes. Um, hi. I thought that your presentation was extremely clever. <laughs> and I'm a big theater goer. I'm not an entertainer, so I'm always the viewer. Uh, I love the fact that you took a piece when I was looking at the description. I said, now how are they going to take a period piece like this and fill seats with today's people? And you did it, the music was perfect. It was current, it had, it had all the ideas of what we're going through now. And it makes you think that we really haven't changed as much in our thinking as we did back then. It's so and true. for me, the term Indian summer will never be the same. <laughs> after framing device, after framing device, and it, you know, it was, initially it was a, a, a house that you heard the argument inside, and these two siblings came out to talk about why do we come here for Thanksgiving every year, and then it was a Wikipedia entry, um, because, you know, Wikipedia is inaccurate, and, you know, it had the, sort of the beginning of the plot of the show, and uh, my... Well, my writing partner and I were researching about, you know, how did Thanksgiving get to be a national holiday? And it turns out Abraham Lincoln, right. a month after the Emancipation and Proclamation. And I that out at the end of Act Two and why he was there. It was funny. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very funny. Now, what happened to Carl the turkey? There was a we time. We had to cut him for time. Oh, okay. Well, there is a He's turkey. Still there. Would you yeah. explain Carl the turkey? Because I think they'd like to hear about it. <laughs> um, Squanto, there's, there's a great, uh, Squanto is, doesn't want to get married, which I think, if you saw it, you remember that he doesn't. He um, decides that he wants, he's going to run away, and he's very much a freewheeling kind of guy, and he talks to animals. So there is an animal course, but his best friend is a turkey, and he talks to the turkey as though it's an actual person, and the turkey makes philosophical points, and they have this... But how does it make philosophical How does it talk to the turkey? He does, you know, oh, and I can't do it. He goes, <laughs> and you understand exactly what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was one of those joys of actually getting to be, because, you know, we've been writing this for so long without actors really doing it, and when we had our first reading that we were able to invite these guys to, we just, you know, it was like this kid, Kit, that our director knew from another show, and he was like, well, I don't know, he'll be in the ensemble, he's a really nice guy, I'll be happy to be there, and he shows up, and he does this incredible turkey voice. <laughs> it was amazing. And also has like, this great, like, deadpan, so it was like, yeah. and so but now we're just, like, writing everything for Carl. <laughs> Yeah. Animal lovers uh, don't 
don't keep your eyes open for that one. <laughs> so many protesters. <laughs> so many. <laughs> yeah. thing and we're always sort of testing things out and seeing what's too far and what's I think sort of our guideline is we're not we don't want to poke fun at actual Native American culture we want to poke fun at like the stupid white people's idea of Native American culture so in a way it'll, it's almost better the more inaccurate we are if we had like real tribe names and real you know spiritual things I feel like that might feel not gonna nasty take it. but it's just <laughs> nonsense so it's like not gonna take it. you know yeah <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was similar to um, uh, the, the work that I did on Altar Boys and trying to figure out how can we make fun of this while we're just making fun of these five characters singing these songs as opposed to really making fun of Christianity and religion. It's, yeah, that, that it, you know, it took a long time for people to understand what Altar Boys was. Gary and I did it together because, well, sometimes they thought it was about molesting young boys, which was horrible, but... Uh, they thought we were making fun of the Catholic religion, and we weren't at all. It was sort of an homage in a way. And it was about those five boys who were wonderful and hilarious, and now we're all starring in musicals, actually. Yeah. And, we and they were young then, and now they were really long. Star makers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Phoebe was the puppet wrangler in Avenue Q. That's how we met, and that's how Gary and Phoebe met, because Gary was our original musical director as well. So you never know where these partnerships are going to start. It's very interesting. And we went to Six Flags Great Adventure one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. And that's how we met. That's how we met. Regina and Gary it's and I spent an afternoon. Very sophisticated crowd. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Roller coasters. Yeah. Because yeah. when you scream with somebody, you might as well write a musical. Yeah. Yeah. That's just how it works. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> we, we could we, fight about that. Yeah. Yeah. This could be the end of the partnership. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the four of us had a lunch meeting because I thought it would be fun to just collaborate together on something. And we all pitched different ideas. Mm -hmm. And the idea that I pitched was doing Lost the Musical, which <laughs> was basically a bunch of strangers find themselves stranded in a deserted land. They think they're alone. They're all just crazy people. They, it turns out they're not alone, and they interact with the other crazy people on this deserted land, and as the plot unfolds, you realize, oh my god, this is the story of the Pilgrims and the Indians, and the first Thanksgiving. So that was kind of how it started, and then we realized, well, you can't really keep that big a plot point a big secret, so we thought, well, let's just bite the bullet and have, yeah. you know, goody whatever, Goody Susanna kicking her legs in tap shoes. So of, yeah, writing lyrics for people that wasn't allowed to know who they were. So really <laughs> um, but that was the, the very basic first idea that developed. And you guys had Hal at that point, didn't you? No. No, no you didn't. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I love that she sings I Want Everything to Be the Same. The same. Oh, yeah. 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 So smart. I, I think it surprised the three of us or all of us, uh, the actors and Stafford and everybody, that that song got any laughs at all. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. really yeah. 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 That song was funny. I'm yeah. delighted. Oh, it is yeah. funny. We thought, oh, we've got to cut it in half. It's slow. It's too long. But yeah. it, that was one of the fun things to learn last night. It was. She delivered it beautifully. Yeah, yeah she did. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, you know, we, we before we came out here, we did a reading in a small rehearsal room. And I, you know, I, I learned the same things over and over again that when you have this kind of high comedy and you're in a small room, the actors are intimidated. They don't, you know, they don't give their all. And so things were not as funny in that room as they were when you put them on a stage and they have a distance from the audience and they can really relax and, and play the moments. Uh, they were all so much better. I mean, they were good. At, they were good to begin with, but they were so much better. I know that our director had something to do with that, but I think it was the freedom of having a distance from the audience. And we always say the second most important thing you do as a producer, after you choose what you want to produce, is choose the venue, the, the actual theater uh, that you're putting it in, because it, it can make all the difference. Well, there's something about a proscenium. You know, I was thinking when Banya Sonia was at Lincoln Center in a thrust. 
it, it, it didn't play, the comedy didn't play the same way it played. When it moved to Broadway and was in a proscenium stage and there was that distance with the audience, suddenly, it was like Charles Bush's play, Tell the Aldous Wife, and it was in that tiny little upstage of Manhattan Theater Club. It played very differently than when suddenly when you're in the Broadway theater and there's that distance, it was hilarious. And it's yes. fascinating how that, and we do, we keep learning that over and over yeah. and over. <laughs> uh, Stephen, do you want us to take some questions from people who are watching this live, or? Stephen Rapp? Yes. Okay. The first question is, how do you choose all these new musicals? How do you identify them? How do you choose them? And then how do you decide what's going to go into your season? Uh, good taste. <laughs> That's such a nasty, arrogant answer. Uh, uh, I, you know, I mean, honestly, everybody, uh, Josh and I work very closely together, and Alex, and, and fortunately we have similar sensibilities. Uh, we all love uh, plays with humor, we like smart things, we love musicals. Um, we see a lot of stuff, we go to a lot of readings, we read a lot of plays, and we read a lot of musicals and listen to them on our earphones. And uh, you just can, you know, certain material, it's, it's original, it's fresh, it's, it's, I always say I'm looking for something I've never seen before on stage, a, a, a way of telling a story I've never seen before, um, all those kinds of things, we want to add anything? Well, and I touched on this a little bit last night, and the this is a little bit of a unique situation because we also have previous relationships. We've worked on shows with them, with everyone up, for the most part, up here before. We had wonderful times. We know we love their talent. And um, they like us enough that they say, hey, I wrote a new show. Will you take a look at it? Will you listen to it? And it's just a continuation of the, the initial relationships that we all started. That's true. Is that a good answer, Stephen? That was great. <laughs> <laughs> to another question, that is, how do you balance uh, the relationships you have with the previous collaborators versus going out and looking for new talent? Well, we, we often return to good collaborators. You know, there's some people you work with, you think, well, you know, my mother would say, Gesai, Gesund, you know, go on, <laughs> be happy. Uh, but we, we always, I just saw Douglas Carter Bean the other day at a rehearsal, and he said, don't worry, I'm writing my new play, you're going to read it, you know, and that makes me so happy because that, you know, we went through a long period together and we, we actually did have a wonderful time. It doesn't mean at some point in the collaboration we didn't have a difficult moment, but we got through it and, and ended up loving each other. And so you hope that the Adam Blancs and the Gary Adlers will come back and say, come to see the reading of my new work, or would you read this? Or, you know, Rajiv Joseph, whose play I produced with Robin Williams on Broadway, he, we're working on a musical with him now. And so uh, relationships in this business are very important, and it's such a cottage industry that your reputation, our reputation, is very uh, important, too, that people want to come to you and they want to work with you. And um, I'm happy about that. And I'm out at least four nights a week seeing shows. And that ranges from a reading in a basement in the East Village to seeing a show on Broadway, yeah. looking for the new talent. And it's not always necessarily that I see a show in its entirety and say, this is something we have to produce, but I might see, I love this score, I love this set designer, I love this, the lighting of this show, and you remember that. And as you were developing shows, you try to bring in these people um, into the fold. I'm older, so I only go three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Uh, the more I see, the older I get. There is so much for you and watching the Nymph Festival and stuff like that. There's so much talent musically. Uh, so many of you can write beautiful songs. I never realized how important, oh, it sounds so naive, how important a book is. You can have beautiful songs, and if you have a lousy book, you don't have a show. That's right. Yeah, it's not a bookstacle, though. <laughs> um, I think that's absolutely true. I think it is true. But but without great, you know, without good music, true. if you have a great book and the music's no good, it, it's just as bad. You know, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think it's a marriage. It's a marriage between the two. I mean, it, 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 Avenue Q. We we found a book writer. Now that's very unusual because the composers Bobby and Jeff had written three or four songs with this idea of doing a TV show, actually. But um, they needed a, a playwright. And uh, we introduced them to two or three people they met. 
and they chose Jeff Witte, you never know until they get into that room how, what that collaboration is going to be like. And, you know, all I ever said to them was, make sure there's a love story, please. Women, <laughs> women buy the tickets. We need a love story. <laughs> uh, uh, it's true. I mean, women do buy the tickets. Uh, but, you know, those collaborations, like these people, I mean, when they started, they just had a wish that it would work because they liked each other and they respected each other. But you just never know until you're in the room what that chemistry is going to uh, create. And it's, it, I always say it has to have a little fairy dust on it to make it great. And I think these people have that fairy dust. And thank you all for coming today because uh, we love your support.